You know, I've been thinking about it a lot lately. And if we're going to solve the problems of this fractured world, we're going to need some dragons. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, you know, I am really happy to have with me today for the Q&A directors Don Hall and Carlos Lopez Estrada, along with screenwriter Kui Gwen. And, you know, this was a really fun event. We did this as a virtual Q&A screening with people from all over the world that were able to watch the film at their houses and then see this Q&A first. And uh, it was it was cool. I love these virtual events. It's it's kind of like a, a really fascinating way to bring people together to have a communal viewing experience online in the in the privacy of their own homes and uh i i, I don't know if you want to sign up and join us you could always sign up at backstory.net slash events and uh you'll get on our list you'll get invited to when we do things and we're we've done a few in-person things here in los angeles but we do these virtual screenings that Yes, sometimes are geo-blocked for the United States, but in the case of this screening for Raya and the Last Dragon, uh, Disney made it available to anyone that wanted to join us in the world, which was actually really kind of cool. And without a doubt, I'm quite pleased with this Q&A as it gives such a fantastic insight into how this amazing film was made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you'll check out our sponsor for this episode, Coverfly.com. If you're a screenwriter who's looking to get your work out there, you'll love Coverfly.com because they curate the best screenwriting talent discovery programs all in one place. At Coverfly.com, you could submit your scripts to writing fellowships, labs, competitions, and festivals, and track the status of your submission through your Coverfly writer dashboard. Also, Coverfly is an incredible resource for helping connect great scripts and writers with industry professionals. To date, hundreds of screenwriters have found their managers or agents through Coverfly.com, and these writers have gone on to write for Hollywood companies, including Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. If you're an emerging screenwriter with a finished script, make sure to check out Coverfly.com to learn more. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And you know, folks, we're just about ready to publish our new issue. It's our Dune issue. It's totally packed. We have a lot of great stuff in it. And you'll be able to check out the table of contents at Backstory.net pretty soon. So I hope you do. And if you want to join us and become a subscriber, we'd appreciate your support. You could use coupon code SAVE5 to save $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these interviews as Zooms have been arriving, uh, support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with directors Don Hall and Carlos Lopez Estrada, along with writer Kui Gwen, about their latest film, Raya and the Last Dragon. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, so really briefly, because I because I I, I want to I have tons of spoiler questions, but we're going to start spoiler free. It's always interesting to hear breaking in stories mm-hmm. and kind of your 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 golden look back at, at how you broke into this industry that has no one direct path. So, Don, starting with you, how'd you get your first break? I yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. This is all I've ever wanted to do. Um, so I was kind of all in and um uh, I grew up in Iowa, and um, I'd heard about this mythical college. And in, in, uh, well, first I wrote Disney, and and uh, that that letter that a lot of people write. It's like, how do I, you know, how do I come to work there? And they said, go to Cal Arts. So, uh, and I'd heard of this mythical college. So I applied to Cal Arts my senior year of high school, got completely rejected. Um, and I had no life drawing, no figure drawing. I don't even know what. I don't even have a portfolio. I just sent a cardboard box with I don't know a painting. Um, and then uh, ended up going to University of Iowa and applied again and got rejected. And on my third time, after I graduated Iowa, um, I third time was a charm. I got into CalArts and um, went to CalArts, loved it, had a great time. And from there, uh, went to Disney. CalArts is amazing. And uh, 
Although I never went there, the closest I ever got was going to one or two of their Halloween parties, which are kind of <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> kind of, kind of legendary. <laughs> As we come up on Halloween here soon, uh, Carlos, tell tell us about your breaking in story. I grew up playing music and grew up watching MTV. And as soon as I started going to film school, I started making music videos uh, for my friends' bands and their friends' bands. And that, uh, long story short, led me to working on a few videos for this rap group called Clipping, based out of here in L.A., uh, where David Diggs sang um, leading vocals. And then that sort of like kickstarted a long creative collaboration between he and I that eventually led us both to New York. He was doing Hamilton and uh, I was just working in commercials and music videos. And that led to my first movie uh, called Blind Spotting that he wrote and starred in. So that that was sort of like my way into the movie making world. I was in the room at your first uh, premiere screening at Sundance for Blind oh, Spotting no and, and was blown away by it. So oh. I love Blind Spotting. So uh, Kui, tell us about your about your path. Uh, I feel like I got here through like uh, a mountain of failure. Like uh, I started out in undergrad as an acting major and I never got cast in anything. So my, like my last year, I just started to write plays for myself uh, to be in. And I realized that I was the weakest link and that uh, I was not an actor, uh, that I should be a writer. And so uh, I, I went to grad school for, for screenwriting and playwriting. Uh, I started a theater company. I failed because I failed at getting people to produce my plays. I you know ended up moving to LA because I failed at getting people, getting my theater company to make enough money for me to pay my rent. And then I ended up at Disney because I failed at ever being on a TV show that lasted more than one season. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up getting here because Don had sympathy for me as I walked in and said, hey, man, can I work for you? And he's like, yeah, do you have ideas? I'm like, I have a few. They're not good. And Don let me uh, put my good, not good ideas uh, uh, on, on, on a script that he would then draw. That's awesome. That's awesome. And obviously having that theatrical background gives you a good ear for dialogue as well. So that's that's great too. You know, just before we fully jump into Raya, it's always fun to hear about lessons, you know, from past projects. We're going to start with you, Kui. Like kind of you broke in through TV. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's where you started building up your credits um, for, for production, at least after theater. What were some of the big lessons that you learned in television that you felt prepared you properly for, for Raya? Uh, well, I think that it's, it's the same lesson I think I keep encountering over and over again, whether it was theater or TV, and that was uh, how much of me needed to be in all the stuff that I write, which is a lot, uh, you know, because when you start, you think that your your job is to to, to write, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to write towards a showrunner's idea, uh, but some writers that don't do as well end up subtracting themselves completely. They're only there to be chameleons. And I realized that my best writing comes when, uh, though I am trying to write in the style, house style that's there, when I put myself in it and put something I really care about in that thing, that's the only way I know how to write. The only way I know how to put something on, on, on screen uh, is by putting my heart there. And I think that that continues to be the lesson that I continue to learn, which is whenever I start to get stuck, why do I want to see this? Why is this important to me? If I can get to that question, uh, I can usually uh, make it through any writer's block that's uh, that's facing, you know, that I'm facing down. I mean, that's that's a great explanation. And, and putting something personal about yourself from your heart helps the emotional resonance of the characters that you're putting down on paper. So that's that's always a that's always a good move. Don, you know, any any particular lessons from Big Hero Six or Moana? That kind yeah. of stuck with you that helped you prepare for Raya. Yeah, I um um I mean one it one would just be you know just visual storytelling, you know, because I'm steeped in Disney history and and I revere so much um all the artists that came before. Um and and just a student of of Disney storyboarding and and um really paying close attention to just the visual storytelling of everything and the sound out, take the sound out, you know, the quiz beautiful words. <laughs> and it tells beautiful words, take them all out, music all out. Uh, and the movie still needs to play and, and tell a story. So uh, I think that was um, a lesson, you know, just from Big Hero, Moana tried to apply that same thing. And and then also just thematic um, discipline in crafting the story. And, um, you know, because I've, I've worked both ways, you know, in, in like kind of being a little 
um, you know, in a place where we're exploring what the theme is, which is code for, you don't really know yet. <laughs> and you're, you're playing around with a whole bunch of different ones and we'll see what one emerges. Perfectly legitimate way to work. Um, but I have found with our films, the more you can come in with a theme that makes make that you love that that you want to see the movie through that lens the smoother everything's going to go and i think very early on in raya uh qui carlos and myself you know we centered on this theme of trust and we thought that that is something that we could explore richly uh in this world of uh raya and the last dragon and we'll definitely get into that in a minute or two uh, carlos you know obviously blind spotting an independent film that's trial by fire it teaches you a lot about production and using the time that you have wisely what was something uh from your past experience kind of coming up the independent route that helped you on raya which would be your first big studio production i mean i, f- I feel like everything did i f- the 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 resilience that you you get in working on these low budget productions and doing a lot with a little and having to create emotion and characters that you can fall in love with when you really don't really have enough tools to do it properly i feel like will translate into everything i do uh, but i also just want to say that entering disney meeting don meeting qui it, it it was a tremendous learning experience for me it was a, a universe that was it's still telling stories it's still making movies in the same way that I, I had been for for years but it's it's uh the intention the level of intentionality the level of thought and that love that goes into every single beat and every single frame is unlike anything I have ever experienced so uh, as much as I think that I I came with a a, a unique background I also um learned so much in the last two years and working with these two. I want to get a, a, just a brief summary of the project because I do want to get into spoilers soonish, but we have a few minutes still. Y- you know, there was something that caught me in the end credits. It said it's based on story ideas by Bradley Raymond and additional story contributions by Helen Califatic. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name, but that was that was my best guess. Um, and, and so, you know, all these stories take years to generate. How, how did Don, how did you come on and, and, and Kui early on and Carlos too, of course, like where was the story when you each came on and what could you tell us just briefly about the Genesis getting to, to the movie that we now know? Cause there was obviously a lot going on before it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, that's not necessarily uncommon, you know, in animation because, you know, we're, we're constantly developing projects. There's so many things that are, you know, being worked on at any given time and, and you kind of see what, what rises. Right. Um, and so this project had been going on for quite a few years, had a, had several sort of different iterations. Uh, and we came on about, a, what was it, fellas, about a year? And like a year uh, and change. A like year and change, yeah, before release. And so it was, uh, it was you know, really kind of looking at what had been done. And, you know, I had seen several versions of it. And I think, you know, Carlos and Kui had as well. And 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 just you know what was asking ourselves like what was our stamp like what we're gonna you know what we were gonna build this film on and um that that first conversation i'm not kidding it was a one conversation we sat down after watching multiple versions of the film and and our discussion centered around this idea of trust and it just felt like that was the thematic that we all felt strongly about um and that that we could you know galvanize the film around and really build the whole film around that uh, that idea. But it happened on that first that first meeting that we had when we uh, were asked to come on. It's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, folks at home are saying, wait, you're coming on and you're watching previous versions of the movies. Yeah. Well, something that's really important to explain is that there's an animatic process mm-hmm. in which the movie lives generally about, from everything I've been told over the years by by the animators that I've talked to, seemingly about four to six times before final release in which it has temporary voice tracks to get Mm -hmm. the the dialogue flowing to hear it out loud and then hand-drawn and or pre-visualized sequences so that they could get a sense of the feel how many iterations did raya go through for for this in in the animatic stage before you came on and then once you were on boy i don't know if i have an accurate number i would say at the very least, probably at least five iterations before we came on. Uh, and then I think we did three or four. Yeah, three or four, yeah. Uh, and, but there may have been some before before those five that I saw, you know, okay. uh, that I'm not and, aware of. So, and, 
And speaking about sort of like the the process that Kui and I had to step into and, and become accustomed to, I mean, that is really the biggest difference uh, out of anything that we had done and the way that Disney Animation builds movies. And it's it's this iterative <laughs> first, uh, process where like the movie doesn't really become a movie until months before it's released. Like it, it exists in sequences. It exists. And like Kui, it's not like Kui wrote a script and then we went off and we did it. And then we put no, like Kui was writing up until like maybe six or seven weeks before the movie was done. Storyboard artists were working. I mean, this is why so many movies, so many versions of the movie existed before we came on is because story artists had been developing this for so, so long, trying out. These the movies at Disney Animation. It's not like they they buy scripts and then they just make them. These are these start from nothing. They start from just like a seed of an idea or a character or a theme. So storyboard artists are are really developing characters, ideas. Sometimes they're boarding chunks of the movie without even knowing how exactly the story is going to work. But they're like, we need to explore this character to know to like really understand. So it's 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 a an incredible process, but it's so unique to animation and so unique to Disney animation that I feel like getting used to it and, and, and being okay with this thing that is alive until you eventually can't make any more changes because there's a due date and you have to put it out. It's, it, it's just like nothing I've ever done. It, it is really wild. And, and, you know, something that I think bears mentioning is just like Pixar there's a very robust story department, including a, you know, a new thing for this movie, which was the Southeast Asia Story Trust. And just tell us about working with the different story departments to get input on characters, input on accuracy for the, for the region of the film that you were making and, and, and how that all coalesces together. Yeah, it was absolutely critical, um, the, the Southeast Asian Story Trust. So it, uh, it's made up of quite a few different people from different disciplines, um, you, know, um, you know, cultural anthropologists, uh, you know, linguists, um, you know, the list goes, you know, musicians, the list goes on and on and on. It's sort of a, you know, a, a, a Avengers a team of the best of you know, that come together to, to kind of help us. And, and, you know, a lot of them, uh, the folks were met on, you know, the various research trips that, that uh, happened during the course of the film. And so that happens so often on these movies, you know, we do so much research early on, go on these trips, you meet people that you really, you know, vibe with and they feel, man, this would be a, this person would be a great ally to, to help you uh, over the course of the next five years or whatever it is when we're making these films. And, and that's how you kind of build your trust. And, and um, I mean, for us, it was not just the screenings. I mean, that was, that's the obvious one, right? You know, looking at screenings, give us notes, but it was all the biz dev, all, you know, think about like five different lands had to be, most times it's one, like for a movie, you do like one world, but for us, it was five. Um, which was a huge undertaking and uh, wanting to draw all kinds of inspiration from, you know, the different cultures, uh, the many different cultures of Southeast Asia. So we really did need uh, a robust team to, to kind of help us out. And yeah, so every, every piece of this dev um, designs, um, you know, went through, you know, the group and we got notes and, and quickly incorporated them animation. You know, we, when we first started doing animation, you know, we would, show them animation and they might have a few notes and we would go back and, and, and uh, make adjustments. So I don't think there was any, any area of the film that the Southeast Asian story trust didn't touch or didn't help us with, you know um, it was, it was incredible to have them as a, as a resource for us. That's, that's awesome. And I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's great that Disney's doing that. You know, it's something that Pixar long had, so it makes sense for Disney animation as well. And even Marvel has their own kind of, writer's room feel in, in yeah. which writers on different films kind of give their two cents to each other to, to keep right. symmetry going, which I think is but excellent. Just, and, just to clarify what, what I was talking about was actually the Southeast Asian story. Uh, uh, no, I know. Okay. And then, yeah, we have our own story trust, which is all the directors and writers who come together to give us all kinds of feedback as well. And in addition to basically everybody in the studio, you know, we're, we're, we're soliciting notes the whole way through. 
Yeah. And it's, and it makes it collaborative and, and, you know, best, best note wins without ego. Exactly. You know, that's, that's the way to go. Uh, I want to talk about your creative habits for a second. Can we, starting with you, how important is outlining to your process when you sit down to write? Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I depend on it fully and completely. I don't, uh, I, when it comes to writing a film, I, I, I like to have my kind of like, you know, my map of how I'm going to, you know, write everything out. But I, I'd say that like, though I have that map, I think the other thing that I greatly depend on when it comes to writing, uh, at Disney isn't so much like, is it, isn't the fact that I sit down and I, I, I come up with the best words and put them on the screen. It's the fact that I too thumbnail my scripts and which allows everyone to be part of this process too. As I'm allowed to give notes about the story artist boards uh, through the direction, through, you know, what I'm seeing on screen. Likewise, I don't try to create, you know, it's not like when I'm trying to write a screenplay and selling it. Here, I'm just trying to go, okay, here's the basic building blocks. Let's build a basic structure. Let's all talk about it. Let's board to it. And then let's collaborate on it. And then when we get down to those final, right, right before we go to record, that's when I start to lock down that script and go, okay, what are the best jokes? Where's the best things to say? But I think the process um, is one that is literally the most collaborative process I've ever been in, whether it be TV, film, or television, or live action film, or television. This is something that's completely unique, which is the the the, the power of the story department, the fact that we all kind of come together. And, and it's not just best note wins, best idea wins, which is uh, something that we all say that, you know, in, in writers' rooms and TV all the time. But truly, at Disney, I, I do think that that's something that, that, that I see over and over again. Best idea does float to the top because we also are doing it for five years. You know, you can fake ideas like, oh, I want to hold on to it for as long as I can. But after that third screening, it's going to fall out. Like, you, you know, ba baby's going to have to die uh, through this process. So, so that's, uh, that, you know, that's a little bit of my process. <laughs> Kill your darlings always exists, even in animation, of course. And, and, you know, another follow-up question to that is, is do you put an importance on getting a certain amount of pages done each day? Or do you prefer to write for a certain amount of hours each day? Uh, I try to, I try to, I mean, I mean, Don, Donald says to it, I just try to get it all done real super fast. <laughs> like I have a, I have a habit of like, going, Oh, uh, so we have those. I try to, I try to be a couple steps ahead of, you know, the directors I'm working with. I see the thing. I start working on it. So by the time I get the note, I've already given you an iteration of it. So we can start kind of on the ground running forward. And it's just one of those things that once you start to feel the rhythm of the movie, the rhythm of the room, it's actually pretty, in my case, pretty easy to just keep running. Um, it's again, everyone has a different process. This is just the process that I found most effective in my time at Disney. Of course. And, and the genius is there's no one way to do it. I mean, that's that's why I love interviewing artists about their filmmaking process, because there's no one way to do it. Which brings me to my next question, Don and Carlos. You know, a lot of people on the outside sometimes get confused as to where the duties lie for directors. So tell us about your your creative working relationship and how you would designate either different scenes or different blocks of movies or even the direction of voice actors, et cetera. Tell us about how you work together as co-directors. I mean, we, we talked about this, yeah, a, a little bit ago that I think people assume, and in many cases, there is a very clear sort of like distinction, dis, like uh, separation of duties, but in, in the spirit of, of Disney animation and just like how these stories are built, uh, Don and I did everything together. Like there was not one meeting that I was there for that he wasn't. There was not one meeting that I that he was there for that I was there for that he wasn't. Um, and it's really it, it's not it's not so much like to to separate work, and it's not so much to like alleviate the workload. I think more than anything is to have thought partners, and and it happens with directors, but it also happens with like the story team. You have a group of people that's exclusively dedicated to challenging your ideas, to building upon them, to offering different versions of, of something that, you know, you, you may have hit a wall somewhere that all of a sudden you have a team of people that are telling you, well, let's explore it this way. Let's have you thought about this. And, and that was really my relationship with, with Don on this. I mean, other than the fact that he has been a Disney animation for so long, 
And me as a newbie, I think I, I definitely needed sort of like a, a mentor figure to understand how these movies are put together. Because otherwise, I, I really think it would have been impossible to just jump into a film and, and understand it. But it was really it felt like a partnership more than more than anything else. And and uh, every single decision of of the final movie, like if you trace it back, like it came down to us sitting in a group and and like really just trying to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and say like what is the essence of this moment and every single decision has a history it's like remember that day when we were bumping against this and then you brought up this story and then i asked this question and then Kui came back with an idea like it that's really how these movies are made and it's extreme collaboration um but it's so rewarding i think once once things start falling into place and the movie starts making sense it takes a while sometimes, but it it really it's it's so rewarding to say like years and years of all of these people's work are really coming down to like these decisions that we're making and they're making sense. Like all all of the research, all the design work, all the story work, all of the nights that we spent just working till late, late, like it's it's they're really all coming together and, and that's the movie that you saw. That's that's awesome, Don. What what have you noticed about the 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 different duties over the years as as a as a co director? Yeah, I, it's um, th- this one is a pretty similar to how you know I worked with Chris Williams on uh, Big Hero Six. Um, um, we divided and conquered a little bit on Big Hero Six in terms of like Chris did effects and I was doing animation at a certain point. You know, like very very late in the game. Um, but, but I, I think Carlos is right. It's less about, um, dividing the duties and more about having, you know, a consensus and, and a thought partner that can, you know, that, that can really, uh, you can really get to the, the best version of something, you know, and, and, um, so, you know, we, sometimes we do divide and conquer if we have to, um, luckily on this one, I think, um, we were able to stick together, uh, for the most part. And, and it just, like Carlos said, it kind of just ensures that the best idea uh, is going to get up on screen. Well, you know, before we get into the spoiler section, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges that you had as our associate editor for backstory magazine, Danny Munso reported you had maybe under 1% of the shots really completed before the lockdown started during COVID in 2020. And that meant that, you know, and we've interviewed a lot of filmmakers about this for live action too, but you would be the first for animation in which uh, basically there was a scramble in which when you're together at a facility, everybody has an internal server. It makes it for doing screenings together, even of the animatics when you're all in a room together, easy. But as Danny reported, there was a system that was kind of built in which you were able to screen at the correct frame rate on iPads to, according to a new internal server that was set up at Disney so that you would each have an accuracy of frame rates and not be dependent on seeing it over something like this that we're in now, like a Zoom, which has frame rates all over the place. Tell us about some of the challenges adapting to that, including directing voice acting from, I believe, the actors all in separate locations as well. I know that we could go a full hour on this, but I, I do want to get into spoilers soon. But please spend a couple of minutes. Tell us about the challenges of, of really building those systems from scratch and staying on schedule. I have to say, like, you know, yes, the, the, there were challenges, obviously. Um but they didn't feel like challenges. And I think that's a testament to uh, the amazing team that made this film. So for instance, the, f- the frame rate that you're talking about, uh, I'll be honest, I wasn't even aware that that was an issue. All I know is like there, there was an app, they said, look at animation on this app. And I'm like, okay. And we looked at animation on that app and uh, what went into it and all the, the, unbelievable, you know, work and calculations that went behind the scenes. I, you know, I wasn't even aware of a fraction, I'm sure, you know, um, because it actually went relatively smooth. And, you know, I think we were all like everybody for the first couple of weeks thinking, ah, this will be a couple of weeks, maybe a month. You know, I don't think in our wildest imaginations, we would have imagined that it you know, was going to last um, what's well, still lasting, you know, year, year and a half, whatever, two years. Um, but it really is a testament to everybody how they just, you know, did whatever they had to do to, to the make technology. it work. 
Yeah. yeah the, the technology team in our studio just did miracles and it really just, we were working in the studio on Thursday of one week. And then the following Thursday, we were working from home. Like that includes like people going back and picking up individual work, like workstations and machines and monitors and renderings. Like it, it all of a sudden we were making a movie from over 500 different homes because that's how many people get to touch these movies. Mm-hmm. And there were, there were, you know, internet was annoying and, and like we had to get used to the, the zoom curve of like all of a sudden working like this, mm-hmm. but they did. So they designed programs. They like, like stuff as Don mentioned that we're not even aware of that you have to do in order to keep a production from 400 different uh, places. And, and it just worked effortlessly and we were able to finish the movie on time yeah is- what about directing actors remotely uh for voiceover sessions i know that wow. that was tricky i mean it was tricky because you know we had to do it from their homes a lot of times in their closets and, you know, we would, and and um you know again we got used to the rhythm of it you know and and uh like for generally the way we direct is i read with the actor and so it, that was always you know, usually when you're in person, you can kind of, you know, I'm not an actor, but I, I at least can read with, because I know the scenes relatively well through zoom. It was much harder to kind of get a, get a, get a vibe going with the actor, but they're all so good that, you know, after a cup, a session or two, it was like, we'd ne- this is how we've always done it, you know? Um, but the other thing that was tricky was um, lighting because that requires color correct right and we're approving stuff on ipads so there was a little bit of i know we had a few discussions where we're like um how's this gonna look on the big screen you know because this is a big movie some of these shots are gigantic with right. you know you don't even know and so we finally that yeah you know, that first time i remember when we went into the theater there was only a, three or four of us spread out um i was a little nervous because like man what are we going to see here that you know that we you know mistakes or this and that and uh, I was surprised, but in a good way, because it was way more beautiful than I ever imagined and, and rich and epic. And just, I think we we're after that first session, when we saw it in the theater, uh, this, the first few scenes, we were just blown away. And uh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, about that because it's very important for you to project it, to really <laughs> see how it looks on a screen. Everyone, and- everyone went into that, that screening, just like crossing their fingers and just being like, Oh man, we're, we're about to find all these little inconsistencies and like, are we going to have to, you know, do, do the movie twice now that we see it on a big screen and realize that all these things that we couldn't possibly catch on, on iPads would pop up. And it, it was, it was that exact reaction, but for the better, it was like, yes, this is a different kind of movie, but now we get to see the textures and the details and the subtleties and the animation and the design. And, and yeah, I remember just, we walked out of that just being like, Whoa, uh, I guess we're, I guess we're just cruising. Yeah. We were geeking out more than anything. I mean, cause like, you know, it's like, wow, that look at that pattern on Raya's Cape that we didn't ever see. You know, there was so many little moments like that where little things that you just didn't notice on the iPad suddenly, you, you just was became the world just became so rich and beautiful. Well, and it's great that the system worked and it clicked together. I would I would love to talk about more of the challenges that you did, but but I want to get into the spoilers right now. So, podcast listeners in iTunes and Spotify, and folks watching the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, if you have not yet seen Raya and the Last Dragon, please fix that. Go go watch it on Disney Plus. And uh, press pause for now because we are going to get into spoilers. Of course, if you watched it at our virtual screening, you've just seen it. Or if you've seen it before, you're you're okay. But you have been warned. We're getting into the spoilers. You know, right off the start, some of the wildest stories I've heard over the years now that we're in the spoilers are some of the things that change in the animatics. I, I'll always, always remember in Zootopia, we did a screening and they said that they threw out who their antagonist was. Yeah. very close toward the end of when they were completing production and had to redo that storyline because they had a better idea. So it was, it was again, what Kui was talking about earlier, best idea wins. Um, what were some of the things that would surprise fans of the movie that changed significantly from one animatic to another, including a global shift like that? If something changed big time with one of the heroes or one of the villains, the biggest global shift was 
uh, not literally, but spiritually, the lead character, uh, Raya, who was completely different in our, uh, when Carlos, myself, and uh, Don uh, came onto the film. Like, in a lot of ways, the Raya that existed before became our antagonist. It was Namari. Uh, she was m- very much, uh, before we came on, a gunslinger, Clint Eastwood type that didn't sp- speak very much, but was a badass with a blade. And uh, but the problem with that is we've seen that character a bajillion time in Eastern cinema all the time. It doesn't feel like a Disney character. And as a person, when I said I have to make it personal, as a person of this color, I when I was a kid, I never wanted to be the badass who didn't talk. I wanted to be the badass with a mouth. I wanted to be Spider Man. I wanted to be Tony Stark. I didn't want to just be the silent type because the stereotype for Asian kids are we're quiet. And so we went the opposite way. Raya became this completely effervescent, fun, lively, Kelly Matrine, uh, Kelly Marie Tran led character. Uh, and then we took all that homework that was already there, nothing, you know, nothing worthwhile is thrown out. And we just shifted it over to Namari. She became the, you know, the stoic badass that also could be the lead character of the movie because ultimately we didn't want any bad guys, but there were small shifts throughout the whole film uh, that we just kind of made our own, Um, but not just to make it our own. I think it goes back to that first meeting that Don said, we sat down, we got into a room and he always likes to make it sound very mature where we're like, "Mm, there's trust. This is a theme that we're going to work on guys. This is the mission, follow trust. But the truth is we spent like seven hours making each other laugh, daring each other to make a movie that we're like, Okay, we may get fired if we do this. Let's give it a try. Let's see if we can pitch it. And that is what kind of kind of stoked the 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 curiosities of you know these these filmmakers in a room that ultimately would have to lead a team with with you know as much passion as we had because we had to sit there and kind of go oh I dare you I, I dare you go pitch that we're gonna make a con artist baby I dare you I dare you to say that we're about to completely change the lead character complete one eighty uh, on the seventh screening of our film I dare you and but that dares those dares that we were putting to each other uh, wasn't there just to kind of prod each other in a mischievous way but to really go what movie do you want to see don hall what movie do you want to see carlos estrada and the and 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 from that kind of like a uh, room of three mischievous guys kind of came we came out with a theme of trust absolutely but also came out with like a true north of what the sound style and feel of this movie was going to be it had to be something more than just a southeast asian drama of stoic beautiful landscapes it had to be something that was inventive something cool and something that i think uh, for me a whole bunch of southeast asian kids would love to see and be inspired by so well, you, you definitely nailed it uh, don and carlos was, was there anything that was a big change that you remember in the animatics something that you're like oh wow we're gonna go back to square one but it's gonna be worth it you know i i will say like um uh, the drone uh, were probably right. went went through a fairly big meta- metamorphosis, and so many things were tried, and and really good reasons for why these ideas were tried. Um, in terms of like what was what was going to be the antagonistic force in the film, and um, you know, at, in some screenings they were more um, they were more, you know, solid and, you know, uh, kind of an army of the dead type of thing. There were multiple ideas, you know, and they were, you know, at the behest of a, you know, uh, uh, Uber kind of demon kind of character and stuff like that. And, and so I knew so many things were tried. And what I think we found is that the, the, what we need for the film is an existential threat, not, a not a threat that has, um, you know, an ulterior motive or any kind of world domination kind of thing. That's not what we needed. If we're going to tell the story about trust, we needed to put a world in duress. We needed to put a world on the brink. Having no idea <laughs> that within months <laughs> we would be living out that story, honestly. But but I do that was the drone were one thing. And, and that's why they have a more ethereal shape. They're not really solid. They're more smoky and and uh, uh, because we didn't that we didn't want them to have any kind of recognizable, you know, uh, aesthetic. They were an existential threat. And well, actually, do you want to? I was going to ask about that, but do you want to tell us a little more about some of the ways that, that the Druid were before? Like, w- was there anyone ever speaking? I, I think the genius of what was done was it shows that we could be our own worst enemies, and they're just a catalyst that that you know is is something that 
ultimately becomes a unifier for everyone to join together and fight against. But while we were in fighting, you know, that's that's why you couldn't get the the one land back together. And it was and it was and it was everybody was in their own little fraction state. But I'm I'm just curious, were there any other versions where the Drew had a voice or something that was they, I don't think they ever spoke. Um so. but but in previous versions there had existed this this like much more uh physical version of them where they had there were sort of like these rock creatures um and and i feel like we when we shifted the focus into making them sort of like this much more amorphous sort of like like faceless uh entities they all of a sudden just became so much more terrifying and just the fact that there was no weapon on earth that would be able to to um like harm these creatures because before there was there was there was this very very clear construction of like raya had a sword that was able to to sort of like um harm them or that that was sort of like the antidote against the you know this whatever the drone material was but the moment where they became this like impossible force to overcome i think that we that's when the the world really felt like there was a real stake and and unless people got their stuff together uh it, it would it would be unstoppable there'd be nothing that could get in the way was the result of their attacks something that changed over time in which you know, the final film, people are frozen in place in stone and they're able to be revived. Was there anything in the previous versions that was ever more permanent? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Not that I remember. Okay. I, I think the the turning to stone was always kind of a central kind of conceit, I think. Of, yeah. Uh, all right. Of, of the, the resting position evolved. Um, oh, and yeah. that, that was after the first screen. Like before, it's a very, very, very subtle adjustment, but it honestly uh, changed the the tone of those moments so much. Before, you would have these people that were would be running, and whenever a drone would sort of like consume their their soul, they would just be frozen mid action in this like you know horrified um, ex- like pose. And then we saw the first cut of that one scene that had a bunch of people. Uh, turned to stone and we just saw it. it's like i don't this is going to traumatize people for <laughs> for a lifetime like there's no way you see this image it was it was horrifying and then we had this big brainstorming session where we were all trying to figure out like how how to make this feel a little bit more emotional and less just like s- straight up horror and someone came up with the idea of uh a resting pose something that felt a little bit more more uh of like a spiritual like they're they're waiting for uh for a chance to come back rather than they're just sort of like a it, was a, it was a great move because they, they seem at peace and that, you know? that that was really what the result of that meeting and then someone said like well water is water is sort of like a key component in the movie and because of the connection to the water dragon so can they be in some kind of prayer pose that 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 is waiting for like the the rain to come back the water to come back and that's how we ended up with these these uh, the posts with the hands. And then anyway, it evolved into this beautiful thing that that uh, just just feels like more of a spiritual take on something that had a very different tone. It was important too because um, uh, the Raya is not out to save the world, um, and that's not her goal. Her goal is just to get her dad back she shifts a little bit towards the end when when she you know at the teachings of sisu being mentored by sisu learning from sisu like how to save the world but that's not the goal the goal is to get is for just to get her dad back and so i think it was important that that pose felt like a sleeping or resting pose because it's the promise of you know if 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 i can do if i can resurrect the last dragon i'm going to get my dad back because that's the um, that's the emotional thread throughout the movie. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And, you know, if you'd like to consider subscribing because we have our new issue coming out very soon, it is our Dune issue. And we have a lot of amazing coverage in there that you're going to be able to read about in our table of contents very soon. Uh, we'd love to have you as a subscriber. So feel free to use Discord. Discount coupon code SAVE5, and that'll save you $5 
off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And you can subscribe through the web over at Backstory.net, and that will still give you credentials to use over in our iPad app. Uh, You could use your same login from Backstory.net to do that. So I hope you consider subscribing there if you want to join us as a subscriber. And look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers at the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these interviews have been going as Zooms during the pandemic, uh, support my passion project. So thanks for considering subscribing to Backstory Magazine. And of course, I hope while you're surfing around online, you also check out our sponsor over at Coverfly.com. Coverfly has proven successful in connecting emerging writers with managers and agents. And writers from Coverfly.com have gone on to work with companies like Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. If you're an emerging writer with a finished script, make sure to check out Coverfly.com. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our conversation with directors Don Hall and Carlos Lopez Estrada, along with screenwriter Kui Gwen, to chat about their latest film, Raya and the Last Dragon. Let's talk briefly about the thematic of trust, because I mean, this this concept of reunification with Kumandra was was really great and beautiful as a place where people were together and they were working together, and it was a place that everybody wanted to go back to, but didn't have enough trust to. And it, you know, it's, it's resonant of kind of some of the, the issues that we have with trust in, in our world today where, where people get fractioned. It's a highfalutin concept for a kid's film. And you guys really pulled it off well, especially because when you're asking for trust, you, you become vulnerable. And Raya was vulnerable a few times. She, she did not get the results that she wanted, which is always a fear of, 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 opening yourself up to trust. And it was a fascinating ending that it came down to Namari to be given each of the dragon gems to pieces to, to put them back together when time and again, she has not always had the, the group's ambitions in, in, in the forefront of her mind. So tell us about coming up to that resolution, because it was a really interesting way to do it. And it showed that when given the right opportunity to be heard and seen, even she couldn't resist doing something for the greater good. Yeah, it was an idea that that um, came relatively early. Uh, uh, at least the concept of that came relatively early in our um, discussions, uh, and I got really excited because I just felt like I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't yeah. think I've that ever means- seen a movie where you basically put every you know everything in the hands of the antagonists and cross fingers and hope it kind of works out. And um, and it meant a couple different you know obviously it was an exciting idea and then we worked like crazy to to get it to to come to fruition. Uh, John Rippa, our co-director, um, storyboarded that that last bit you know and. Uh, it was, he's one of the best storyboard artists in in the world. Um, But he did an amazing job on that section as well. And it really, I think for us, because we were just so excited by the idea to see it kind of come together like that meant, you know, we had to build to it. Like you said, we had to build in the infrastructure of Namari being completely unreliable. Like the, the last person in the world that Raya should be trusting in that moment, but it took that kind of leap of faith to make it happen. Um, and I think that's one of the things I think we're all, you know, so proud of uh, in terms of the movie is that ending, the emotional wallop, you know, that it that it hopefully has uh, for the audience. But it it also what it meant too was that we had to flesh out Namari. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she had to be a complex character, and and that's the other thing I think we're really proud of is the the character of Namari and how she, um, you know, voiced by Gemma Chan, obviously how she how she ended up in the film. Like we, we really kept honing and, and working on her character. Um, and I think for a lot of us, you know, she, she turned out to be one of our favorite characters. Yeah. I, I mean, that, basically a dueling protagonist, if you will, but go on, yeah. what were you going to say? No, just in talking, you were asking about what changed in, in the film. And I think it was the ending because the, we always knew from the beginning that the movie ended with these five protagonists from different lands, putting together the pieces of the, of the dragon gem but it felt too easy. Like when, when you, it's like, you know, that there there's five disparate lands, you know, there's a representative from, from each, each of them. Each of them has a dragon piece. This is a Disney movie. Like, of course they're going to put it together. And like, that's how the movie ends. Right. 
And I think that as we were trying to find nuance and layers and, and to truly create a situation that, that not even ourselves would know exactly like how, how would they get themselves out of it? The moment that we shifted that, that and say, well, Namari is going to be responsible for that final assembly. All of a sudden it just became like unexpected and really profound. Uh, and, and I think that as Don mentioned, it was just like, that image, we knew that that Im image existed and just trying to say, how can we make it feel even like more unexpected? So by the time she's given that, that um, decision, like she, she's faced with that decision, you really honestly have no idea where it's going to go. Like it's, it's, you're in, you're in there making the decision with her. I mean, I remember the day, I mean, like going back to that, like mischief dare, like I remember the day when, uh, when when we were battling about how to make that ending and you know it came up it was pitched um that the first person that that goes is raya and i remember don like eyeballs got real big he's like are we allowed to do that are we allowed to do that i was like don we're allowed to do what we want we might as well try it and don just got giddy like a little kid and he's like i don't know he stood up and he took a pace across the long table and he sat back down and he looked over at carlos and carlos like carlos was in his pensive state like i think this is good i think this is good and they both looked up was like let's do it let's script that out let's see what happens if we take out the lead character first and let the bad guy of our film be the last hero. And it was, it, but it was that, that was what a room, the Raya room felt like. It was this incredible room. And I, I call, include like Paul Briggs, Adele Lim, and John Rippa, the co-directors and my co-writer in there with Fawn, who's our head of story. We were all throwing our stories, our best ideas at, you know, at the table all the time. And it was that collaboration that kind of came up with this unique, ending that uh, none of us knew was going to be our ending until we were in that room that day. It's always interesting to hear during the editing process, just, you know, because it's the last stage of storytelling when you're really editing. And obviously you've gone through this animatic so many times. What was the scene that you had to take out? What was something that hit the cutting room floor that there's maybe a lesson behind? Either it was, it was you know, it was, there was a redundancy or something like that. Don, I see you nodding. It seems like oh, yeah, yeah. there's one I, I remember very distinctly. It wasn't a very long scene. It happened uh, uh, probably around the middle of the movie. It's after uh, Namari has confronted Raya in the um, Tail Temple and um, on her on her ride, Namari's ride back to Fang. And um, John Rippa over the surf. <laughs> yeah, John Rippa over a weekend. We got very excited by like, well, what if Namari had an encounter with the Droon and, you know, she had to save her, um, her uh, um, Fang um, soldiers and yeah. just, a, just a cool, badass Namari thing. And Rippa's like, oh, I totally see it. And whenever John Rippa says, I see it, you just let him go because uh, you'll get something amazing back. So he worked the weekend, came back, pitched it to us like, oh, this is awesome. We cut it in to the reels and we watched it. And then I had a very sinking feeling it was like, Oh no, mm -hmm. we can't use this. <laughs> and, and, and we all had the same feelings. Like we're now starting to like Namari. We can't like her now. We can later, later. Yes. But at this point in the movie, when we just essentially met her as an adult, can't be rooting for her. Can't be rooting for her. So it was a, it was really cool, and it would have been amazing in animation because there's really cool physicality and, and stuff. But um, that one had to go. And Ripa, to his credit, even though he'd worked all weekend, was was absolutely one of the first to be like, "Yep, totally, yep." Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating because you did have some foreshadowing, in which point of view is also always important. Yep. And there's times where the audience sees things that that Namari is doing that show that she's questioning her mom. And show that she's questioning their their kind of trajectory that they're on, but Raya is not privy to that information based on the point of view of the audience. So it's it, I, I could see how that went. You know, I know we're starting to run out of time. So what, one question I really want to ask you all, and I'm sure it's going to be different from each of you, is is your toughest scene and how you creatively rose to the challenge to to solve the problem. So Kui, starting with you, the toughest scene on the page. Something maybe you came back to over and over again, got the sweats about late at night. And then how did you solve the problem? What clicked off? 
Uh, the toughest scene, man. Like it's, uh, I, I mean, I know the scenes that I rewrote like a bajillion times. Uh, uh, I don't, but I don't know if I would consider them, you know, the toughest scenes, like the last scene, obviously, where we give away the thing and Namari, you know, saves the day. That was one that, you know, we iterated on all the way to the end. It was, it was definitely one of those scenes. Uh, the, the introduction to Sisu was a, a major one that we, we worked on the, the, the talent, the whole section talent w- w- was an interesting thing. But I think like, if it was like a single scene that like kind of just, got my crawl and just bugged the crap out of me. Uh, it was probably that the, it's an early on scene between uh, little Namari and little Raya. And they're sitting there trying to be friends at a party. And there's so many different renditions of two little girls hanging out. And I wrote every single one of them from them being pranksters, from them being like, kids from the mall in 2021 style to them being way too like, you know, reverential, like, I went through every iteration uh, because you knew that this was like the first chance that you got to really know these characters and you kind of fell in love to that friendship. So when it broke, it was a little heartbreaking. But uh, but I I think that was that that was a hard one. And I don't know how we unlocked it, but uh, it it definitely at some point. Uh, I think Don or Carl is like, this is the one. This is just there. And I was like, okay, fine. So Carlos, you keep what was the scene for you? I mean, I was going to say that too. There has to be like, I don't know what, like 40 versions of, of that scene, if not more. That was one that was animated and then we had to go back and change. I really don't even, I think that we just stopped working on it because we ran out of time. Uh, just because it it sets up so many, it sets up Sisu, it sets up the Raya and Namari friendship but also like it's it's just that ending that you get it's all set up here right like the fact that fang is struggling the fact that heart is thriving the fact that like they both have this love for the dragon and it has to be real because then at the end when amari kills sisu um like it's it's you have to you have to know how difficult this is for her you like it it was just planting like a hundred seeds for everything in the movie and once you would solve something, you would realize that it op- unlocked like Pandora's box for this other thing. And that it, it just had to do like so, so many things. And it was the kind of sequence where whenever someone said like, okay, we have to work on Dragon Nerds, everyone, all of us would just be like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it happened for months and months and months and months. So I don't know. Don may have a different one, but yeah, I feel like. I'm curious to hear it. I mean, there were so many nuances because you just said, you know, when Namari kills kills Sisu, but but really that really wasn't her intent. It's Raya's sword coming at her that made her right. finger on the crossbow twitch there were so many nuances that's that's what i really love about the movie but don tell us your there, tough scene yeah there was a there was a version of the movie where it was uh namari more directly killing sisu and it didn't work for all the reasons you can imagine because she loves dragons and sisu more than anything but um uh the one i would say that i i think was probably one of the trickier ones because it was it came in it was one of the later ones as Quee alluded to uh was the intro of sisu and as you can imagine, you know, that uh, we kind of knew that Sisu was going to be a, a um, memorable character. He had all the makings of it. Obviously, Aquafina, you know, an actor that is amazing. And we wanted to honor that. And that one went through a lot of iterations. And I remember very early on when we first got on the movie, I, I called in a favor from uh, Byron Howard, a fellow director, Byron Howard, uh, um, to, uh, to board that scene. Because Byron is one of the funniest, uh, he'll just come up with some crazy, funny, very specifically Byron kind of stuff for that scene. And we knew he wanted it to be funny. And so Byron took the first stab at it. And he's, I think we only got him for like a week and a half, but it was enough to get, you know, some. The some idea is rolling. Absolutely. Yeah. Big time. And and then from there, Lewis Logan oh, you know, took it and. And kept doing multiple passes on it. But that, that one was a tricky one to get right. You know, and the, the right balance of. Um, you know, the physicality of Sisu uh, versus, you know, what she knows, what she doesn't know, what was her last thought, you know, because all that kind of went into that scene, as you can right, imagine. You're talking about the rules right there. And she exactly. wakes up thinking it's the same day she turned to stone exactly. and didn't realize that it was 500 years difference. That's exactly right. And so that, you know, and, and, and making sure we're asking the right questions, but doing it in an entertaining way. And so that one, that one, you know, took a little bit to, to, to get right. But um, I love the way it turned out. 
Well, look, you all have been so generous with your time. I, I wish we could talk further, but I know we're out of time. Thanks again for speaking with us today. And of course, congrats on Raya and the Last Dragon. Don, Carlos, and Kui, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. I appreciate it. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so thank much for having us. us. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to Disney for making this cool virtual event possible. And if you would like to join us for further events, just go on over to backstory.net slash events and you could sign up to get email invites. And of course, special thanks to directors Don Hall and Carlos Lopez Estrada, along with writer Kui Gwen for being so generous with their time in chatting about their latest film, Raya and the Last Dragon. Of course, I would also like to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Coverfly.com. If you're an emerging writer with a finished script looking for representation with an agent or a manager, check out Coverfly.com because they have had a good success rate of connecting with writers and their writers have gone on to work for companies like Universal, CBS, Netflix, Amazon, and Blumhouse. So if you have a completed script and you're looking for representation, but you're also looking for a way to track your script as you submit it to festivals and fellowships and labs and competitions, go check out Coverfly.com to learn more about it. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you'll also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, we are publishing our new Dune issue soon, and uh, there's going to be a lot of amazing stuff in it. Of course, as always, you could read Backstory on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory, and we would love to have you as a subscriber. And so to sweeten the deal, I'm offering you discount coupon code SAVE5. That'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers over at the Backstory Magazine YouTube page who are watching the Zooms of these interviews that have been happening during the pandemic. Uh, it would really mean a lot to me to have all of you go on over and become subscribers of Backstory Magazine. And now is the best time to do it. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Folks, if you ever want to reach out to me, you could, of course, track me down on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith. I also run the Backstory underscore Mag account on Twitter. And actually, it's those same two accounts on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. I have a Facebook fan page that I use sometimes. I'll check it a little more. You could also always drop me a line over at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. I promise not to read it immediately, but I will get back to you. There's just been a lot of mail coming through lately, so I'm trying to sort through it. But it's always good to hear from you, and I definitely want to respond when I can. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.